failure. And he wanted to quit. He wanted to resign. And uh, he couldn't believe, he felt a personal responsibility for every one of those lives. And his father said, it's the best thing that could happen to you because now you know who you're dealing with. Yep. Yeah. And he realized at that moment that he was surrounded by military brass and by an intelligence apparatus that considered war not only inevitable but desirable. And that the function of the CIA had devolved into providing our nation, not protecting our country and our national security, but providing the military industrial complex with a steady pipeline of new wars. And when they came back to him and said, we need to invade the Laos, he yeah. said no. When they said repeatedly again and again and again, all of his advisors, we need to send 250,000 troops into Vietnam, combat troops, he refused. Yeah. He said he refused to send even a single combat troop. He sent 16,000 advisors, mainly Green Berets and, and Navy SEALs, a, a unit that he had just started. And he um, and that was fewer men, fewer soldiers than he sent to get James Meredith, one black man, into the University of into Old Miss. And then in October of 1963, a month before he died. He heard that a man had been killed. One of those Green Berets had been killed in Vietnam. And he said, give me the casualty list. And one of his aides brought him a casualty list. 75 Americans had died. And he said, that's it. I want them all home. That's too many. Wow. And he ordered them. He signed a national security order that afternoon, ordering all troops out of Vietnam. The first thousand by uh, December, so two months hence, and then the rest of them by 1965. And he said, we were done. A month later, he was killed. And a week after that, LBJ revoked that order and ultimately a year later, sent 250,000 troops there. And then Nixon sent 560,000 and 56,000 would never come home, including my cousin, George Skakel, who died in the Tet Offensive. And my uncle understood that, you know, the function of these agencies was to to keep us in war. And we need a president of the United States who understands that and who is able to stand up. Cold War ended after that all came down in, in Germany. Um, we were told that we were going to get a peace dividend, and that we could we could reduce military expenditures to 200 billion a year. Uh, but then we had 9/11, and and now we're our military expenditures in this country now, if you include veterans, which cannot be cut, and national security. It's 1.3 trillion a year. And we can't survive on that. We spent 8 trillion on the Iraq war. We need, we spent 16 trillion on the lockdowns. That's $24 trillion. And uh, is it any wonder we don't have a, a middle class in this country? In March, I have a friend, a lifelong friend who's a commercial fisherman. And he's on, he's worked his whole life. He has a fishing business that he's had to give to his son-in-law. He can't work anymore because it's a hard industry and he has severe disabilities. He relies on food stamps, $285, $283 a month. And by the way, that those food stamps have, have bought him a lot less food over the last two years because the inflation, officially inflation, has raised the price of food by 20%. That's right. But in reality, for for basic foods like dairy, like eggs and chicken, they're up 76%. Marvel. So his dollar, his food stamp is going a lot less. $283 barely feeds him. It's $9 a day. And you know living in this state, he lives here now. Trying to feed yourself on $9 a day is a challenge, but he was able to do it. On March 1st, he got a robocall from the government telling him his food stamps were just cut by 90%. His now, he, he now gets 
$25 a month, which is 90 cents a day. And, you know, and 30 million Americans got that same call. A week after that, 15 million, Ameri million Americans were cut from Medicare. What? That same month, the government printed $300 billion to bail out the Silicon Valley Bank. No! And, no! and we, talked no! off, we talked off our assistance to Ukraine uh, at $113 billion. No! CDC's entire NAP annual budget is $12 billion. EPA's entire natural annual budget is $12 billion. We're sending $113 billion over there when 57% of Americans cannot put their hands on $1,000 if they have an emergency. We have a crisis here in this country. And the whole world has a crisis. If, if, democracy collapse, if we don't have a middle class in this country, democracy is going to collapse. If you read any social, uh, political science book, and they'll all say that configuration of having a, a, a stratified society with a very, very wealthy aggregations of wealth at the top and widespread spread poverty below, it is much too unstable to support democracy. It cannot happen. You have this polarization, you have a breakdown of institutions. It can't happen. We need a democracy in this country. We need a middle class if democracy. Yes. And you go. If, if our democracy collapses, we are the exemplary democracy. We're the democracy upon which the entire world models itself. Woo! And we have an obligation to the world to rebuild our middle class in this country. We need to take those trillions of dollars home, and that's what I'm going to do as president. I'm going to, I'm going to bring back the peace dividend, and we're going to cut those military expenditures, and we're going to stop bailing out the banks, and we're going to cut the military expenditures, and we're going to bring them home to the American people. We're going to take the, the, the instead of building a billion dollar stealth bomber, that cannot fly in the rain. We're going to build schools, and we're going to build roads, and we're going to pay teachers a piece of salary. And we're going to focus on building the promise of America that my father was so proud of, that my uncle was so proud of. And since 1638, we've been told that this is the place where we're going to build a city on a hill. A shining city on the hill that has become the model that will be the model for every nation around the world. Yes. And that is our job. Mm. Our job is not to make war abroad. Our job is to bring it on and it's the best thing that we can do for our national security. My uncle refute would never send anybody to war. He never sent a combat troop into action in his presidency. And he said that he wanted to make sure that the, the viewpoint of foreigners abroad, of an American, was not a man in a gun and a helmet. It would be a Peace Corps volunteer. And he launched USAID, which is now just the CIA front, because they took it away from him, which paid for the, you know, the, for the revolution in Iraq in 2014. He created USAID and Alliance for Progress to go to, to stop the US foreign policy at that time, which was to give money and weapons to dictators and to solidify these oligarchies in Latin America and elsewhere who were stable and, and would, you know, who were reliable friends of the United States. And he said there's gonna be a revolution in those countries, and the, either the communists are gonna take are, are gonna hijack it, or we are gonna win it through with the force of idealism. We need to be in those countries creating a middle class. And he created Alliance for Progress, USAID, the Kennedy Milk Program, which gave nutrition to children, hundreds of millions of children around the world. And that was his foreign policy. And today there are more statues to my uncle on, in nations around the world, there are more boulevards named after him, more avenues at the capitals of every nation in Latin America and Africa and Europe 
or universities and hospitals named after him than any other president of the United States. That's not just a vanity for my family. It was so important for the United States of America that people loved our country. It's so much safer for us, so much easier for us to do business abroad if people like our country rather than thinking that we're there to bully them. They want our leadership. They want our moral authority, and they know the difference between leadership and bullying. And the Chinese have figured this out. The Chinese, instead of projecting military power abroad like we do, which is just broken things, uh, we are projecting economic power. And while we spend $8 trillion bombing bridges and roads and hospitals and, and, uh, and schools, during that same period, the Chinese spent $8 trillion building hospitals, schools, roads, and, uh, and universities with no strings attached. And what happened? They are now reaping a bonanza because all those countries want to deal with them. And our now entire national security formula, which was the Shia Triangle, we have 800 bases abroad, and they're all based on keeping intact this triangle of Saudi Arabia, uh, Oman, Qatar, Abu Dhabi, Jordan, Lebanon, all the way up to Syria, and containing Iran. That is our principal foreign policy uh, strategy. Well, what happened? The Chinese just went in mm -hmm. and made a peace deal between Iran and Saudi Arabia. Uh -oh. Well, the keystone of that entire strategy has now disappeared. And the Saudis, Mohammed bin Salam, two weeks later, this has happened in, in May, uh, Mohammed bin Salam, two weeks later, drops oil production at a time when America is in the middle of an inflationary spiral. The Saudis have never done that to our country before. Three days after that, he explained himself, unless it wasn't clear, clear he said, we don't care what the United States thinks anymore. <laughs> we pump trillions and trillions of our dollars there in military aid. And it's very clear, you know, we, we are like the alcoholic who is behind on his mortgage and he takes the milk money and goes to the bar and is buying drinks for strangers and thinking thinking he's making a lot of great friends. And that's what, that's what our foreign policy is. And all we've got is made enemies. And it's time for us to bring that money home to focus, very, very laser focus on rebuilding our industrial base, rebuilding the middle class in this country, and rebuilding a sense of dignity, real building communities that give our children the same opportunities for dignity and enrichment and, and good health and prosperity and pride in our country that I grew up with. I had yeah. such immense pride in the United States of America when I was a little boy. And I want my children to have that. And all of you want your children to have that. And they're taking away from us. Hell said that we need an army. He said, we need a miracle for this to work. Right. I said to my wife, I feel like we're getting a miracle every day. Yeah. And that is coming just all the things that they said, okay, that, you know, that this campaign is going nowhere, that it's a joke, it's fringe. They still treat me as a fringe candidate, and they say he doesn't have a chance, and they don't even put me in the polls a lot of times. They're wrong. I'm, They're wrong. And I'm... I'm way ahead of DeSantis. Woo! Yeah! <laughs> so, I mean, my numbers are much better than his, but he's treated as a as a legitimate candidate. They're lying. So I don't know. I feel like that's okay. They don't have to treat me. All we have to do is win the election. <laughs> and some ground to stand on, and I will give your country back to you. <laughs> 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 